Hi. Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the element of content in modern painting and from my point of view the severe decline of painting in the 20th century from uh, its last great height so to speak in the latter part of the 19th. Now I think we can take a look at our first picture here and we see Van Gogh's Starry Night. Uh, we have a close-up detail of it. We'll pull back on it a moment and, and get the whole picture. But uh, in the 19th century Van Gogh is pouring his whole heart and soul artistic soul into a picture of this sort where after a lifetime of poverty and struggle uh, sells one painting during his lifetime uh, in 1889 a year before he dies he paints the this well-known picture you know and we say to ourselves well you know it's a, a rather personal style a personal point of view about a, a night an unusual whirling form in the center of the sky the stars are luminous and shining over a quiet uh, country night in Arles in southern France where Van Gogh seeks refuge from the trials and tribulations of an unsuccessful art life in Paris. But of course there's much more than that. In one of his letters Van Gogh states that uh, the stars in the sky can be equated much with the uh, black dots on a map of France and as during one's lifetime one tra takes an earthly means of transportation to go from dot to dot from town to town in France uh, so death is the vehicle by which one will travel from star to star. So that uh, this becomes a tremendously rich, mystical, personal statement, an attempt by a human being to resolve some of the problems of his own existence. You know, when we look at the cypress on the left, and there's no question that Van Gogh identified with the cypress tree, and the, the writhing, twisting, reaching upward of that tree toward the heavens is a graphic presentation of Van Gogh's own spirit, his own uh, personal searching for uh, fulfillment uh, in an afterlife, so to speak, after his personal life has been so unfulfilled. Okay, we'll be going to the next picture in uh, just a moment. And uh, here we have a self-portrait by Van Gogh. Uh, the color is maybe a little bit, there we go. It's gotten some of the richness of it. And here we see a total human being in total need. In the deep recessive quality of his eyes, his glance, his gaze, the way the paint has been put on with a great deal of, of rhythmic ordered passion, but passion nonetheless. Here's a man who lays his soul out on the canvas. Uh, a little bit later we're going to be seeing pictures of modern painters who uh, assume the most shallow vision of life and they simply do not probe anywhere near this deeply, extremely superficially. Uh, in our next picture, we'll be looking at another Van Gogh, the uh, Road with Cypresses, and here again, just to emphasize the reaching, yearning quality of the cypress, Van Gogh's identification with it. It's obviously right in the middle of the, the painting. There's a star on the left and a crescent moon on the right, and one can almost see the moon and stars as eyes. And the two workmen go to work at the bottom. They're partly cut off, but we're, most of us are familiar with the picture. So there's the whole episode of, of a daily life here magnified to mystical uh, proportions. Okay, we go to the next, uh, next picture. And in contrast to Van Gogh's vision of a, a universe in upheaval, very emotionally, very personally conceived, uh, here we have Paul Cezanne's uh, rocky scenery near Aix, his hometown in southern France in Provence. And notice the difference in the, the feeling of the landscape, the sense of permanence, of rocky solidity, of an enduring quality. Uh, that is in opposition to the transient, evanescent state of Van Gogh's spiritual quest. They're both uh, modern masterpieces of landscape painting, but one is a vision of an other world uh, in which the real world is transposed. He looks, they both looked at the real world, they both examine it very carefully. And now this is in contrast to uh, many modern painters who simply ignore the outer world. And it's my premise that by ignoring the outer world, or by just depicting its negative aspects, the qualities of art are diminished, 
Uh, in other words, abstract art simply cannot reach the level of art created from reality, no matter how it may be changed. Okay, we go to the, another picture by Edgar Degas here, entitled Sulking. Now, this is not, this is early in Degas' career, uh, of course, a contemporary of Cezanne and Van Gogh. And we're looking at it very briefly in order to see the sense of content in the picture, where Van Gogh is looking for, for heaven, in a sense, in earth. Uh, Cezanne is looking for a stability, a monumental stability in his pictures to counter his own personal uh, sense of insecurity, inadequacy. He was a tremendously volatile personality. Degas, in his early paintings here, uh, is very involved in the psychology of people and often the psychology of men and women. Perhaps you're familiar with his Bellelli family where he depicts the psychological rift of husband and wife and children torn between the two parents. Now we could look at this picture and say, well, it's, it's a beautiful genre picture uh, in Degas' early style with a great deal of detail. But what's important here is the psychological connotations, the relationship between the two figures, and how that relationship is expressed in the design, the pose of the two picture, figures, as well as the painting behind them. So, I, I have a feeling that Degas, so sensitive to psychological relationships, is, uh, has conceived everything here with a purpose. For example, uh, obviously the man, they're, they're in an office setting. Perhaps the woman is his secretary, perhaps his mistress. He's the boss. He's sitting by the desk. And the, he's turning away from her. And Either one of them is sulking because obviously she's making demands on him. Perhaps the affair is over. Perhaps she wants him to marry him uh, or whatever. Notice the way she leans over the chair, you know, as if she's trying to get over a hurdle to reach the man. Look at the horses behind her next to her head because whatever is near a person is associated with that person. Look at the horses floundering over the obstacle in the painting. So we look at the man. He's turning away. Uh, he doesn't want to have anything more to do with the woman. Look at the horse associated with his head. He, the horse is balking as it goes over the hurdle. So, so that, in other words, we have uh, not only a beautiful painting in terms of emotions expressed, solid reality, a beautiful composition, but composition used with psychological effect. I mean, you can go on in pictures like this because they're deep, they're rich. And it's my premise that much of modern painting is so shallow that it it wouldn't even consider a, a, a depth of this sort, a depth of emotion, uh, and that because it is so shallow, it simply doesn't offer us anything in terms of, of spiritual fulfillment, emotional fulfillment, what have you. In our next painting here by Adolf Gottlieb, as an example, uh, the abstract expressionist painting in the uh, 1950s and, and early 60s, uh, See, here we have a contrast, you know, as we had a contrast between the man and the woman, but it's between these uh, even circular spheres at the top, which represent purity and harmony and, and world wholeness, and the irregular form at the bottom, which represents chaos, struggle, savagery. See? So that in an abstract sense, we could say, well, he's expressing a conflict between two worlds, but in such a superficial way, and if you've seen much Gottlieb, you would realize that it becomes a formula that's repeated and is hollow, and, and rather empty, and one becomes tired of seeing these uh, over-obvious, simplistic, artistic versions. Then, so we can go to the next picture. And uh, here we'll see some of the, some pictures that set up the 20th century. See. Now, I, it's my premise that modern artists in our own time, contemporary artists, are running away from life. They've been scared out of their pants by the horrors of it, by the insecurities of it, by the breakdown of tradition, by the wars, by everything. You know, and I, I have a feeling that in America today, we're all living in a climate of quiet desperation, waiting for the bottom to fall out. Now, in 1935, Salvador Dali, as a, in his surrealist picture here, soft construction with boiled beans, premonition of civil war, is expressing just that. It's a horrifying image. It's a terrible uh, image. Uh, but it's an extremely successful surrealist picture. Here he has the body politics, so to speak, of Spain tearing itself apart 
with that ugly clasping blackened hand symbolizing death and destruction, clasping the breast and stretching it and tormenting it. Of course, the breast, the symbol of life, uh, mother's milk, and so on. So as horrifying as it is and as uh, unusual as it is and as shocking as it may be to us and as surprising that artists would paint pictures like this, it nonetheless uh, expresses some of the uh, horror of the 20th century. We go to our, our next picture here. And uh, a painting by David C. Quiros, Mexican painter in the 30s as well, entitled Echo of a Scream. And we have, again, we've almost, we've seen war pictures in Vietnam in World War II where children are sobbing amidst the wreckage of their society. And this is C. Quiros' response to some of the horrors of the 20th century. So, I mean, at least in these artists, whether you, you enjoy surrealism or you enjoy a savage expressionism of, or in social comment of the type of C. Karras. At least they're, they're saying something. Uh, it's overwhelmingly negative, but, it, but at least it will have a cathartic, uh, a sense of catharsis, maybe draw our attention to uh, problems, or at least we'll be able to sob with the victim here and cleanse our own souls. We go to the next uh, picture. And uh, here we have another Mexican, uh, Orozco, in his gods of the modern world. And we say, well, what are the gods of this uh, terrible new world, this great new world? And they're the gods of, of bureaucracy, of academia here, particularly. He attacks uh, academia. And we see a little uh, a hunched uh, robe figure on the left uh, serving as midwife as he brings to birth a still life fetal skeleton from death itself, see? And they, everyone stands around their academic robes with their honors and their insignia, while in the foreground there are the tubes and bottles resting on desiccated books, the bottles containing uh, fetuses of the new messiahs, so to speak, if we want to think of these are gods. And, and the messiahs are false prophets. They're, they're dealing in death and values without any substance. So we go to the next picture. And we have Diego Rivera, another Mexican painter who's giving uh, his vision of the brave new world. And here we have Detroit, his uh, mural entitled Making uh, a Motor. And here his vision of the world is man enslaved to the machine. And, perhaps, and of course I'm showing it because I think we are slaves of technology. We relish the gadgets. We relish uh, all of the products of our computer society, we're even trying to make computer art out of it, uh, you know, which is the, the height of, of insanity, and that we've lost our human qualities and become almost machine-like ourselves. And in this next picture coming up, we see another uh, painting by Rivera entitled The New Freedom. And of course, it's just going a step farther, becoming more obvious that these women at the presses, the punch presses, are almost engulfed by a mouth-like shape at the left that threatens to gobble them, and uh, different racial types, blacks imprisoned in boxes and people in masks behind bars being beaten. And it's his uh, social commentary on, uh, on society, 20th century society generally that is repressive to the human spirit. We go to the next uh, a painting. And, you know, in 1945, Ben Sean paints a picture entitled Liberation. And uh, what a sad liberation it is at the end of the Second World War. The s surviving children of the Holocaust swing like scarecrows or, or dead laundry at the end of a maypole, which usually signifies life, as surrounded by the wreckage of their society. It's not a very positive view, and I wouldn't recommend Sean as, as a major artist. But nonetheless, he's responding to the life of his time in his somewhat overstylized fashion. We go to the next picture. And, uh, you know, it, even de Kooning in the 50s, in his Woman One, is expressing the, s s the desperation of the human psyche, the human soul in post World War America, particularly. He's an American, uh, Dutch, but he's been in America for so long that, that he would be considered American. And, and this woman, de Kooning, will say that he is women irritate him, and we can say, well, this is his response to women, that he doesn't enjoy women always, that there's something about him that bothers, bothers uh, him. 
Uh, as he'll comment, perhaps it's the woman in himself that irritates him sometimes. Uh, but he also will say, well, what am I supposed to do? Start from scratch, you know, go back and rediscover the art of painting. I have to take painting where it's been left to me and carry it forward. And that may be one of the fallacies of 20th century painting, too, because so many younger artists uh, consider Pollock like Christ, and there's a, a BP and an AP before Pollock and after Pollock, and that Pollock is the beginning of everything, and one must build upon Jackson Pollock, and that's pretty shaky ground to come on, as we'll see in just a moment. But uh, de Kooning is uh, not only talking about his the savage state of his own personal soul, but this woman represents all humanity in the 20th century, savaged by a dehumanized society. Yes, America is better than Russia, it's better than China. We're talking about relative issues, but in terms of the technological dominance of our society, the fact that it's, it's, we're heavily under the influence of the, the corporations, that recently there are demonstrations in New York about um, anti-nuclear uh, power plants, anti-nuclear uh, stand that the people are taking, and it'll have very little effect, see, that the human soul is savaged in our own time and, and ravaged, and de Kooning is saying something uh, of that. See, now, it's the function of the artist to express his deepest soul, and here in a painting by the French artist Daumier in the 19th century, I think he captures beautifully a, a moment of inspiration. You know, there's a certain electric quality as the artist stands back to survey his evolving work. And, and there's a magic about it. And, and there's a beauty in the, the concept of it and the execution of it, the solidity of the figures, the reality of the emotional quality uh, in the picture. We go to the next uh, uh, work. And we'll see uh, a modern artist involved in his work, a, a photograph of Jackson Pollock standing over his drip painting uh, in the early stages of it, a photograph taken from above Jackson Pollock down at the lower left center, uh, dripping his paint upon his canvas with a stick or a brush, taking it out of a paint can. One of Pollock's uh, positions, aesthetic positions, was that he wanted to have himself be a part of his painting, to, to really throw himself into his work. And in a sense, it says something about uh, Pollock's psychological needs to, to make a significant art statement. It also says something about the fact that the relationship of the artist to his art is somewhat tenuous in our own time, that we literally have to physically be there, in a sense. And as, as someone has pointed out, that the relationship of Pollock to his painting, despite his standing in it, is, is rather more tenuous than uh, Daumier's artist because he doesn't feel the pressure of the canvas with his brush. It's very tenuous, airy connection between the drips. There's really no physical connection with it at all. Whereas in the brush painter, the, the painter feels the response of his brush uh, pressing on the canvas as if the energy flows in a continuous physical contact with the uh, canvas. So in, in this picture by Pollock, in his uh, uh, period from 1947 to 51, when he is involved in his drip paintings, and this one entitled Number One, uh, it's my premise that th these are not simply decorative works, they're not simply aesthetic experiments, they reflect the deepest uh, sufferings of his soul, say. And while I say that, I am also saying that contemporary art is so limited and so narrow that even though we sense the deepest vomitings almost of his soul in pictures like this, that, that his deepest feelings and the form they take simply are not going to be able to stand up to some of the past great evocations of the soul. Now, when we look at a picture like this, uh, I think we see an artist who is saying that the world, there's a certain chaos in the world, it's almost a web-like interlocking affair that he's trying to force himself through in order to find a solution to find his fulfillment in the great beyond, so to speak. We go to the next picture. And this is an earlier Pollock in 1937 called The Flame. And I show it only to suggest that there is passion behind his work, that there's almost a figure crumpled in the center, roasting on a grid, a griddle. And I would suggest that's Pollock himself. 
Pollock in his personal suffering. He was a troubled individual, and uh, even though his mature period from 47 to 51 with the drip paintings, it might be said to reach a, a golden age, relatively speaking, in his own art. There's still a great deal of suffering there. We go to the next picture. And a couple of more quick examples. This is not a Pollock. This is a Soutine portrait of a man in green. Uh, and I, I would say this could almost be a portrait of Pollock. This could be a portrait of 20th century man, compressed, distorted, pulled from pillar to post, with nothing solid to depend on, and uh, subjected to a, a deep depressional state. OK, we go to the next picture. And uh, this is a Pollock in 1943 entitled The She-Wolf, influenced by Picasso. See, he goes the route through Picasso in order to find his own artistic fulfillment. I would say that is just as dangerous, using Picasso as the basis of your artistic expression for slightly earlier artists, which a whole generation of artists in the uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s did, uh, because Picasso had already removed himself from nature and had uh, abandoned nature, really, and made his arena of expression the two-dimensional surface of the canvas, which all artists must do, but when you abandon nature, you descend into uh, artificiality. And we become farther and farther in our own time. But there's a certain savage passion here in this picture. We go to the next one. What we're, we're talking in this uh, program, the first part of a two-part program, and we'll continue with it as we go along. But here's Pollock, uh, a drawing of War, 1947, and it's Picasso influence, and also uh, showing the turmoil of his soul. OK, we go to the next picture. And some of them can assume a fairly decorative quality, this uh, obviously from his drip period. And the real tragedy in Pollock, and I think exemplifies the tragedy of the 20th century, contemporary artist is that he tried to get away from the drip paintings. The public, not the public so much, the public is always behind the artist, but the galleries and the critics said, hey, well, what's going on? Here's the one artist who has established a personal style in his time. Uh, he's trying to go back to the figure, which was anathema at the time of abstract expressionism. Thomas Hess and Art News and others just raved endlessly, endless diatribes against the figure and figurative painting. So Pollock was trapped between his desire to move on, move out of what is essentially a blind alley. You can't go on making drip paintings forever and ever. And Pollock found that out from bitter experience. And so that he couldn't go back, he couldn't coast, as Selden Rodman in his interesting book, Conversations with Artists, states. And he couldn't go back to the figure so that he was caught in limbo. In the last two years of his life, he didn't paint. And then one night, at the age of 44, driving to Long Island, possibly drunk to ease his pain. Uh, he was a drinker. He was a sufferer in that sense. Uh, he had an automobile accident. Uh, driving alone in his car, he goes off the road. Now, one can say that it, it was just an accident, or one can say that uh, the artist uh, had reached the end of his rope, that it was literally a suicide. Say. And I would suggest that the terrible trauma, the terrible dilemma that Jackson Pollock found himself in is the dilemma, is the trauma that contemporary artists find themselves in. They've tried to go back to the figure with photorealism. Geometric painting, obviously, is still tremendously uh, vogue-ish. And I think that's, it is a total vogue. Uh, I think. Photorealism, there's a mechanical, a hard quality about it that um, is very geometric and, and very expressive of the technological dehumanization of 20th century man. And Pollock's dilemma is our dilemma still, with individual artists suffering and with the art world as a whole suffering, because we have to make the vital connection once again between art and life. So thanks very much. Uh, next week we'll have part two. Thanks for being with us. Uh, I'm Don Gray. Bye-bye now.